Hi, listener. This is From Ideology to Unity, a spiritual journey where we let go of ego and ideological doctrine in favour of meaning, purpose and unity as a whole. Today, I'm doing a reading from the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation. This is um, a Hebrew text, I, I suppose. Um, translated by Dr. W. Wynne Westcott. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad, it's an interesting that I got my hands on this because um, it was actually a gift from someone. Um, someone, um, I, uh, and it, you know, a distant relative, or not, distant relative? Yeah, I suppose a relative who died, but yeah, I managed to get my hands on this anyway. It's pretty interesting. So, and this is uh, published Cambridge, 1978. So, pretty interesting. So it's uh, probably linked to the Kabbalah, especially given that it has the tree of life on the front. Uh, now, I have been interested in the Tree of Life and uh, the Kabbalah for a while, so hopefully this has some interesting insights. I don't really know much about this, so we're going to find out. So, any other interesting information? Um... Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, and the 32 Paths of Wisdom, translated from the Hebrew and collated with Latin versions. Dr. W. Wynne Westcott, on, Honorable Magus of the Society of Rosicrucians, in, well, that's what it says is, Magus of the Sos Rosh in Ang. Uh, you might be able to see it if you're watching the video, but uh, I, I think it's the Rosicrucians. Um, anyway, which are, I, I think they might have Gnostic roots, but I'm not sure. Maybe there's a link to the Templars. I, I don't know exactly, but um, I, I think there are not Gnostic aspects of the Rosicrucians. Um, So, and, uh, that, and that person is, um, yeah, so Wynn Mescott is the author of a treatise on the Isaac Taz tablet, the ever-burning lamps of the ancients, and a monograph on suicide. So, yeah, that's interesting. So, introduction. The Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Formation, is perhaps the oldest philosophical treatise which is yet extant in the Hebrew language. The great interest which has been evinced in late years in the Hebrew Kabbalah and the modes of thought and doctrines allied to it has induced me to translate this volume from the original Hebrew texts and to collate them with the Latin versions of medieval authorities. Three important books of the Zohar, or Splendor, which is the great storehouse of Kabbalistic teaching, have recently been, for the first time, translated into English by that skillful and erudite Kabbalist, my fellow student in occult science, Mr. S. L. McGregor Mathers. And this Sefer Yitzhara, in an English translation, is almost a necessary companion to these even more abstruse disquisitions. The two books indeed mutually explain each other, that Sefer Yetzirah is not in any sense a narrative of creation or a substitute of gen or a substitute genesis, but it is a very ancient and instructive philosophical treatise on one aspect of the origin of the universe and mankind, an aspect at once archaic and essentially Hebrew. The grouping of the process of origin into an arrangement at once alphabetic and numerical is only is one only to be found in Semitic authors. Attention must be called to the essential peculiarity of Hebrew doc doctrines. The in 
inextricable and necessary association of numbers and letters, and every letter suggesting a number, every letter suggesting a number, and well, it says published by G. Redway London, this introduction, so there we go. Every letter suggesting a number, and every group of letters having a numerical signification. So that is pretty interesting. There's a sort of, what, symbolic numerology there or something? Interesting. As vital as its literal meaning. So obviously symbolism is very important here. The principles involved in the Hebraic reversal of letters and their substitution by others on definite schemes should also be studied and borne in mind. It reminds me of the idea of the, uh, the, the idea of reversing tarot cards. I don't know, just seemed relevant somehow. It is exactly on these principles that the groundwork idea of this disquisition rests. And these principles may be traced throughout the Kabbalist, pardon me, <laughs> the Kabbalistic volumes which have succeeded it in point of time and development, which are now associated together in one volume known as the Zohar or the Book of Splendor, a collection of treaty, treaties which is in the main concerned with essential dignities of the Godhead and with the emanations which have sprung therefrom, with the doctrine of the Sephiroth and the essences of Macroprospus and Microprospus. The Sephir Yetzirah, on the other hand, is mainly concerned with our universe and with the microcosm. So keep in mind, um, definitely reminds me of the idea of the uh, hermetic principle of correspondence. As above, so below, as below, so above. And that certainly does relate to the macrocosm and microcosm. Also note that if you've read or heard my episode on the, um, if you've read the Emerald Tablets, if you've heard about it or anything, you might know that the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, uh, I can't remember the other second name, Trismegistus or, or something, then the microcosm and macrocosm is very much referred to, and it does relate to law correspondence, I'm pretty sure. Right. Hebrew tradition assigns the doctrines of the oldest portions of the Zohar to a date uh, and ten, oh wow, okay, antecedent to the building of the second temple. But Rabbi Simeon ben Jokchai, who lived in the reign of Titus, AD 70 to 80, is considered to have been the first to commit to these to writing. And Rabbi Moses de Leon of Guadalaxara in Spain, who died in 1305, certainly reproduced and published the Zohar. Ginsberg, speaking of the Zoharistic doctrines of the Ein Sof, says they were unknown until the 13th century, but he does not deny the great antiquity of the Sefer Yetzirah, in which it will be noted the Ein Sofer and the Ein Sof are not mentioned. I suggest, however, that the, this omission is no proof that the doctrines of Ein Sofer and Ein Sof did not then exist, because it is a reasonable supposition that the Sefer Yetzirah was the volume assigned to the yet Zeratic world, the third of the four Kabbalistic worlds of emanation, while the Asht Metzaref, look, I'm probably butchering pronunciation, that's just going to have to be how it is, um, is concerned with the Asiatic fourth or lowest world of the sh of shells, and is on the face of it an alchemical treatise, and again this Sifra Dzenutha may be fittingly considered to be an Isilithic work, treating of the emanations of deity alone. And there is doubtless a fourth work assigned to the world of Bria, the first, second type, but I have not been able to identify the tre this treatise. Both the Babylon and the Jerusalem Talmuds refer to the Sefer Yetzirah, their treatise named Sanhedrin certainly mentions the Book of Formations, and another similar work, 
And Rashi, in his commentary on the Tuxi's Erebin, considers this a reliable historical notice. The work then, or a similar predecessor, is at least as old as AD 200. Other positive historical notices are those of Sadja Geon, who died AD 940, and Judah Halevi, AD 1150. Both these Hebrew classics speak of it as a very ancient work. The most general, generally accepted modern opinion is that the author was Rabbi Akiba, who lived at the time of Emperor Hadrian, AD 120. Greats, however, assigns it to early Gnostic times, third or fourth century, and Zun speaks of it as post-Talmudical and belonging to the Geonic period, 700 to 1000 AD. And it's not surprising that the Gnostics are involved in this in, on some level. Uh, Rubin Son in the Bibliotheca Sacra speaks of this latter idea as having no real basis. The Talmuds were first collected into a concrete hole and printed in Venice, 1520 AD. The Zohar was first printed in Mantua in 1558, again in Cremona, 1560, and at Lublin, 1623, and a fourth edition by Knorr von Rosenroth at Salzbach in 1684. Some parts are not very ancient since some versions mention the Crusades. Six ancient Hebrew edi editions of the Sefer Yetzera were collected and printed at Lemberg in 1860. The oldest of these six re recensions was that of the Sadia Geon, who died 940 AD. Commentaries by Judah Halevi and by Ebin Ezra of the 12th century are also known. These are now to be found in the best libraries. Several Latin versions, viz. that of Grillemus Postellus, 1552, Paris, one by Johann Pistorius and his artist Capellistae Thomas. 1587, uh, Basile and, or Basil, and a third by jo Johann St. Ritt Angelius, 1642, Amsterdam. This latter gives both Hebrew and Latin and also 32 paths a supplement. Something about 32 paths gives me a sort of Buddhist vibe, but that might may well be a coincidence. Oriental Sopis, what about I say? Oh, yeah, I, I entirely skipped two pages, pardon me. Sticking pages there. Right. There is also a good German translation by, actually, it may, it's making me wonder, like, how much of this introduction do I really want to read out? Uh, I suggest you be patient with me, it won't be long. Um, there was also a good German translation by Johann Friedrich von Meyer, dated 1830. Quite recently, and since the completion of my translation, my attention has been drawn to a version by Isidore Kaslich, Kaslich in which he has reproduced many of the valuable annotations of Meyer. The edition which I now offer is fundamentally that of the ancient Hebrew codices translated into English and collated by the Latin versions of Pistorius, Postellus, and Ritangelius. The following copies of the Sefer Yetzera in Hebrew I have also examined. One, a version by Sad Sadaya, Ab, Ben, David, and three others, Mantua 1562. Two, a version with commentary of Rabbi Abraham F. Dior, Amsterdam, 1642. Three, a version with preface by M. Ben J. Shaggis, Amsterdam, 1713. Four, a version Constantinople, 1719. Five, the, uh, the, the same. Uh, uh, yeah, a version Constantinople. No, oh, wait, okay, so so is, uh, what's the thing? Ditto, the Ditto Zokio 1745, Ditto by Moses Ben Jacob Zozek 1779, 
Ditto, Grodno, 1806. Ditto, Dian Firth, 1812. Ditto, Salonika, 1831. And, oh, uh, and 10, um, a MM MSS copy dated 1719 in the British Museum. You know, maybe I shouldn't be reading it out this way because it might be not interesting, but uh, that's how I'm doing it. I add here the full titles of the three Latin versions. They are all three to be found in the British Museum Library, or at least they were when it was written. I don't know if they still are. Abrahami Patrokai Liber. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to bother with that. That's Latin. So. In Thomas Primus of Art, I'm going to skip out a little bit here because it was Latin. But in Thomas Primus of Artis Cabalistae, hoc, hoc est reconditae theologicae et phil philosophiae secret scriptorum, Balasai 1587, is found in Liber de Creatone Capastinus, Hebraicae Sefer. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure about. All these details to be honest. Um, okay, this might be useful information. The oldest title has, as an addition, the words, the letters of our father Abraham, or ascribed to the patriarch Abraham, and as and it is spoken of as such by many medieval authorities. But this origin is doubtless fabulous, although perhaps not more improbable than the supposed authorship of the Book of Enoch mentioned by St. Jude and rescued in the modern times by the, from the wilds of Ethiopia by the great traveler Bruce. In essence, the work was doubtless the crystallization of centuries of tradition by one writer, and it has been added to from time to time by later authors who have revised it and made editions. Some of these editions were which were rejected even by medieval students, I have not incorporated with the text at all. And I present in this volume only the undoubted kernel of this occult nut upon which many great authorities, Hebrew, German, Jesuit, and others have written long commentaries and yet failed to explain satisfactorily. I find Calice speaking of these commentaries says, they contain nothing but a medley of arbitrary explanations and so mystical distortions of scriptural verses, astrological notions, oriental suppositions, and metaphysical jargon, a poor knowledge of physics, and not a correct elucidation of this ancient book. Kalish, however, was not an occultist, but these commentaries are so extensive as to demand years of study, and I feel no hesitation in confessing that my researches into them have been but superficial. For convenience of study, I've placed my notes in a separate form at the end of the work, and I've made a short definition of the subject matter of each chapter. And uh, there's an asterisk here. The substance of this volume was read as a lecture before the Hermetic Society in London in the summer of 1886. Most of the notes were remarks offered in explanation of obscure points to which attention was directed by the discussion which followed the reading of the lecture. So. If you got through that, um, we can start the actual text proper. Chapter one, section one. In two and thirty, most occult and wonderful paths of wisdom did Jah, the Lord of hosts, engrave his name, God of the armies of Israel, ever living God, merciful and gracious, sublime, dwelling on high, who inhabiteth eternity. He created this universe by the three Sepharim, Sepharim. and I think Sepharim relates to angels or is it archangels or something? Number, writing and speech. 10 are two, 10 are the numbers as are the Sephiroth and 22 the letters. These are the founding of all things. So there are 10 numbers and 22 letters, which are the founding of all things. 
So I imagine the Godhead out from the Godhead came for frequencies in the form of numbers and letters, 10 of them and 22 letters, 10 numbers, 22 letters. And perhaps it was the first emanation of creation, the voice of, for vibration of source, perhaps. That's one way to interpret it. That's just what came to me. So, um, one of these letters, of these letters, three are mothers, seven are double, and 12 are simple. Hmm. Yeah, I um, double has a duality to it, I guess. But honestly, mothers, that implies feminine. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, the 10 numbers formed from nothing. That's where everything comes from. Because nothing in particular has the basis for anything. It's a sort of superposition, perhaps, or it's a sort of a sort of source field where there's all the possibilities are there, and yet none of them are particularly manifesting until well, one does. Act of creation effectively would uh collapse that superposition of all the possibilities where there's nothing there, let's say, into one which plays out. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is um, in my readings of um, the uh, quantum physics, what was it? Quantum Theory and Free Will by Henry B. Staff, which I recommend, uh, there was it went into um, process one and process two, which I talked about. Introduced the concepts were introduced by von Neumann, uh, the physicist. And what essentially is is that, well, pro, if you look at it, Copenhagen it's your interpretation of quantum physics as a description of reality, which would make sense, uh, as opposed to just sort of a, a set of formulas to use. Then what it would mean is that. Process two is the Schrodinger equation playing out, the laws of physics just playing out basically. But Schroden, uh, but process one is, this involves the Born rule, and I don't know if you have any idea what that is, but it is effectively the quote, choice of which possibility it is. And if you can, I think count the um, pantheism that we are all one and that it's all one, then essentially whether it's nature or our conscious mind of making a decision does not really differ. It's all conscious infinity, right? It's all consciousness that chooses the outcome. And based on consciousnesses, consciousnesses, not just one, but a set of them, or well, all, it's the interaction, the co-creation of consciousnesses that of these different states and these different choices that effectively determine what choices happen. Now, these choices of what manifests from the infinite possibilities, this would be, this would be um, the sort, well, this would be these, this emanation of possibility. The creation would be, okay, for, so there's all these possibilities, the infinite possibilities, and what is manifest is when it's chosen or decided or manifest from the mind, because mentalism is the, the hermetic law that mind over matter, mind creates reality. So the conscious infinity will create by process one and of all these different possibilities, a process two will play out and that will operate onto let's say the law of physics, but which it is, is beyond physics. Um, now, this is relevant, I would say, because I'm pretty sure there was a reason why it was relevant. 
well, these letters and numbers are the foundation of all things, right? But what, where do they come from? Well, you could say God or source, right? Um, and you know, there was something else here that gave me that impression. Or maybe not, maybe not, but it felt right. So I'm going to just go with that. Um, and it seems that of the, in the original moment of creation, there were numbers, certain numbers and letters that came to be perhaps 10 numbers and 22 letters. Now, what do we know about numerology? In numerology, uh, which is essentially the mystical art of the symbolic meaning of numbers, you could say there are 10. Well, I mean, some people might say there's nine, right? Um, because 10 is arguably one and zero, but what is zero? It kind of represents Euroboros infinity and one. So maybe it's it's not just, maybe one is like, one could be seen as everything being one and the creator, but oh, the zero is like, it kind of is one as well, but zero is more unity. But what's the difference between one and this and unity? I mean, it's kind of similar. Like, I don't know, but you could potentially make the case for there being 10 numbers, not nine. I, I don't know exactly what the basis would be, but. Maybe one and zero are two sides of the same coin in a sense. Or perhaps the zero is the nothingness from which the creation comes from, which is one. I don't know, this is speculation. So the 10, not three, the 10 numbers formed from, oh, formed from nothing. That's why I was talking about this, wasn't it? I was talking about the conscious nothing, everything coming from nothingness, the infinite possibilities where nothing in particular is true, but anything, anything in particular can come from, uh, which also links to the, the nothingness spoken of in Taoism and in Asian ideas like Buddhism. Um, this nothingness being the root of everything. Well, the 10 numbers formed from nothing and they were formed from God. So God is nothing, but what is nothing? It's potentially anything, the infinite potentiality, the infinite possibilities. So God is nothing and everything. And naturally the source of creation, God, it, it, it would be non-dualistic. It would be because duality isn't the whole, it's two. Whereas the source of everything is the one. So, was it the zero? <laughs> I think you see what I'm saying anyway. So the, the, the 10 numbers formed from nothing are the decad. These are seen in the fingers of the hands, five on one. Five on the other and over them is the covenant by voice spiritual and the right of circumcision corporeal as of Abraham. Oh, and after covenant, this is brackets four. So maybe it's referring to the next number we've got here. Um, also, I wonder if the, the, the meaning... <laughs> Which of these things are said in alignment to which numbers, which section? There's one, two, three, four. Maybe there's numerological meaning there too. So, I mean, it starts with one, the original thing, and it's talking about in two and 30, so 32. Most of, I don't know what 32, most of, 32 must have numerological meaning. And it would be useful if I knew what 32 meant in numerology, but I don't. So you could quickly Google that and not might be, well, I don't Google it, but so use the search and to find out what that means. It might enhance 
you might it might help you understand symbolically something about um, the fact that it says two and thirty. Was it yeah two and thirty? Was it two hundred and thirty? I, no, I don't think. I think it's thirty-two parts. What that means, because I, I don't know precisely. And is Jah Jehovah? I don't know, but it's Lord of Hosts. Um, yeah. In two and thirty, the, the occult and one the most occult and wonderful paths of wisdom did Jah, the Lord of Hosts, engrave his name, God of the armies of Israel, ever living God, merciful and gracious dwelling on high, a sublime dwelling on high, who inhabiteth the eternity. He created, created the universe by the three separim, number, writing, and speech. So number, writing, and speech are fundamental aspects by which everything is created. Uh, there's three of them, which is of significance. Number, I mean, numbers, mathematics. In mathematics, there is definitely, it can definitely uncover meanings about things. Neurology is significant too. And I think that when you look at the fundamental integers of which there's only really nine or only ten you know it's they have a lot of significance in the universe the rest are just composite numbers now writing but that, that, that's uh, symbols do actually have significance in that form too they they definitely create things uh letters uh and there's so some more fundamental ones perhaps and as for speech, that's the vibrations, right? Frequency, vibration. That is obviously very much linked to creation. So this kind of makes sense. And these are separate. So I, I don't know why I said, why I said, okay, perhaps it's linked to archangels. And maybe on some level it is, but it's talking about like three things here. Although it does interest, it is interesting that in um, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, there are these be oh man, I haven't actually finished that yet, have I? There's more readings to do on that. But there's these beings, I think there's seven of them, or is there nine of them? And nine is a significant number, isn't it? That would be interesting for us nine. But there's a certain number of them. And um, but it doesn't go from oh, this think there's seven of them, but it starts at like three. It doesn't start at one for some reason, which is kind of odd, but but they were relating to certain things. I wonder if that's related. I don't know. Anyway, um, so that's one. And it's talking about the original creation of how it was created. And it would be number one, section one, where it's talking about that. The original first act of creation, it makes sense. Two, might involve duality, who knows? Um, 10 other numbers, or numbers mentioned in the first bit, as are the Sephiroth numbers. So there are 10 Sephiroth representing numbers. So each, so there's what, maybe angels representing numbers or archangels representing numbers? Interesting. Um, are Sephiroth and Sephirim the same sort of thing? I'm not sure exactly. And 22 of the letters, and these are the foundation of all things, in the universe, so this is once the original creation has happened, perhaps, or at the same time, I don't know. Of these letters, three are mothers, seven are double, and 12 are simple. Okay, well, there must, there perhaps is a reason why that's in number two, but there we go. Three, the 10 numbers are formed for nothing, Another decad, obviously related to 10. Uh, these are seen in the fingers of your hands, which is really interesting that, you know, yeah, I mean, it's counting the farmer's fingers, but you know, digits. That is sing symbolically significant, I guess, Bose. And uh, yeah, it seems significant. The covenant is referring to the Bible. No, well, it's not the Bible, the Torah, you know, uh, in some way, but. I, I don't actually know it that well, to be honest. And it, it never really had much interest to me, the, uh, the Old Testament. And um, the covenant might relate to circumcision. 
and it does mention that. Um, I don't even know what symbolically circumcision is meant to represent or why it's done, just that it's done. So if I knew that, I could maybe give some interesting insight on that, but I, I don't. So there we go. It's as corporeal as of Abraham. So it's a corporeal representation of something symbolic. And that's why it's done. Okay. Ten, four, and that represents three, which is what, unison of opposites somehow? I don't know. Four, 10 of the eight numbers of the ineffable separate off, 10 and not nine, 10 and not 11. Learn this wisdom and be wise in the understanding of it. Investigate these numbers. I don't know why it's 10, because 10 does seem like a composite, but then again, it's a composite of one and zero, and maybe one and zero are two sides of the same aspects of the same thing, and thus it's not really the composite. And so maybe there's a one on either side of infinity, or a one on either side of creation somehow like bookmarks bookends like um telomeres um there's different ways of representing different levels of reality right i mean there's seven um in the law of one there's seven Entities in each octave, and uh, but there are systems that, that you could split things, split it up into nine or other numbers. There's different ways of representing it. Um, so technically, you could say it's arbitrary because, on some level, because you can infinitely divide it up. But given that there's only a certain amount of fundamental integers that the rest come from, maybe it would make sense not to go beyond 10 in terms of how many you divide up into. Um, but it does say not nine, as if some people might mistake it as being nine. And I don't know why it's 10 or not nine. And that's intriguing to me. Because in certain new numerology, it seems that it, it goes up to nine. Like 999 is a really significant number, but not 10. 10 is one, I think, in numerology. So, um, and draw knowledge from them, fix the design in its purity, and pass it from from it to its creator seated on his throne. And this is five in brackets. Learn this wisdom and be wise in the understanding of it. Investigate these numbers and draw knowledge from those numbers. Uh, fix the design in its purity and pass it to its creator seated on his throne. So, so, yeah, sorry, I just um, <laughs> had a brief break there. Um, draw knowledge from the fix the design of the purity and pass it, pass from it to its creator seated on his throne. So, we we learn wisdom and understanding and we investigate numbers draw knowledge fix the design in its purity so suppose somebody be correcting impurity into purity or something but then we do all that and then we pass it back to the creator so it's like allowing the creator to gain experience, at least if I look at it in law one terms. So it's it's a service for the creator in a sense. 
five, these 10 numbers beyond the infinite one have the boundless realms, boundless origin and end, an abyss of good and one of evil. Boundless height and depth, east and west, north and south, and only one God and king, faithful or ever seated on his throne, shall rule over all forever and ever. The infinite creator. The source of all things, all that is. Um, these ten Sephiroth, which are ineffable, whose appearance is like scintillating flames, have no end but are infinite. The word of God is in them, and they, as they burst forth, as they return, they obey the divine command, rushing along as a whirlwind, and returning to prostrate themselves at his throne. Um, I recall there's a being in the Immortalis of Thoth described as like a pairing, like a flame, or at least a figure of flame. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so consciousness is kind of described by Thoth as a flame, or at the very least a spark. Um, and that the extent of that flame is basically the extent of the consciousness. And also regarding how shrouded it is also, is also a factor, but in darkness that is. So, but it makes sense that it's a fire, a fire of consciousness. Have no end but are infinite. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It would be infinite. The word of God is in them. They're like the original word of God or foundational word of God, or just the word of God in a holistic sense. Uh, the word of God is in them and as they burst forth and as they return. Burst forth and return. That reminds me of the Lord one. So this idea of souls coming out coming down or into physical reality right and like having incarnations gaining experience and eventually going back into source and with experience that's a harvesting is in the harvesting of experience up and up and up to the hole again hole again maybe that's it and maybe before it goes all into source directly it goes into 10 separate Sephiroth, which then from there goes from Sephiroth up into the year of the unity of all things, perhaps, perhaps. Um, they obey the divine command rushing along as a whirlwind. So almost like an extension of source itself, perhaps. Um, interesting. These 10 Sephiroth, which are moreover, although one of them is meant to be evil, that's what it says. Wait, have, they have the boundless realms. These 10 numbers beyond the infinite one. So they're created by the infinite one for the infinite one, yet are beyond it. Okay. Beyond infinity, that, that's interesting. But, um, and they themselves are infinite. Interesting, very interesting. Boundless origin and end, so kind of beyond time in a sense, and an abyss of good and one of evil. So an abyss of good and an abyss of evil. Why well, didn't say one of good and one of evil though? Boundless height and depth. Wow, that's interesting. Well, okay, six. These ten Sephiroth, which are ineffable, whose appearance is like, okay, we've we'll covered that. Ten, seven. These ten Sephiroth, which are moreover ineffable, have their end even as their beginning. It's the idea of time being an illusion and all being one moment and all being one whole. Conjoined even 
as is a flame to a burning coal, for our God is superlative in his unity and does not permit any second one. And who canst thou place before the only one? So they're all infinities beyond the infinite source and yet are unified as part of the infinite source. I, this seems like a contradiction or paradox, but perhaps it relates to the idea that there's there's source and it's the different souls that make up source. And then there's the holographic universe. Uh, and they go into the holographic universe. They dwell in the holographic universe, these 10 numbers, whereas the source of all things in this text, God, does not. Um, and as yet to this decade of the Sephiroth, restrain thy lips from comment. Oh, I already did comment, so. <laughs> um, and thy mind from thought of them. And if thy heart fail thee, return to thy place, for it is written, the living creatures ran and returned, and on this wise was the common made with us. This is a covenant about returning the source. And the breaking of the covenant is trying to delay it or rebel against that, which would be service of self, maybe. I think that's a bit tenuous, that interpretation. So, nine, these are the 10 emanations of number. One is the spirit of the living God. Blessed and more blessed be the name of the living God of ages. The Holy Spirit is his voice, his spirit, and his word. So, they're all different. These are 10 emanations of the one. Numerologically, that makes sense. And just in terms of the idea of the symbolism of the monad, right? And the unity and everything from one. It just makes sense to me. I mean, unity is a very big theme in my podcast. <laughs> if you've been listening to my podcast or watching it, you, you'd know what I'm talking about. Why one immediately? Doesn't, like It resonates in a way to me. So the Holy Spirit is his voice, his spirit, and his word. But the Godhead might be the origin of even the Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit, you cannot reduce all that is to the Holy Spirit, right? 10, second from the spirit he made, air and formed him for speech, 22 letters three of which are mothers, A-M-S-H, seven are double, B-G-D-K-P-R-T, and 12 are single, E-B-Z-C-H-H-I-L-N-S-O-T-Z-Q. The reason why some of them are double letters is that it's translated. In Hebrew, it's very much likely that those sounds are have their own symbols. Because um, they've got a different form of alphabet. If I if I remember correctly, it's a type of alphabet. Well, it's not technically an alphabet, but it's a type of language called uh, with a language called an abjad, which is actually similar to Arabic in some respects, in the sense that it's an abjad. Anyway, so it doesn't have vowels. Or at least, okay, what it has is consonant symbols, and then it has your things above and below that represent the vowels, right? Um, and anyway, aside from that, certain sounds, they, they, they represent as actually just a symbol for that. In fact, it kind of makes, it's kind of weird that in our English, in English, they've got two letters for one sound. Why? Why don't we just have one letter, like, we could just use the nor symbol for th, for example. Like anyway, anyway, there's a nor symbol for the, but whatever. Um, and tz as well. That's probably something we don't really use in our language much. But 
Yeah. Um, but the spirit is the first among these. First of these letters, A, or the first of everything, which, well, all these things are made from the spirit. Although air might be relating to A, I don't know, because air might have a different, be like linked to a different letter in terms of their alphabet, whatever. So, but yeah, so spirit was created first. Well, second. No, it was created first, and then air. So it's spirit, like the like the ether um, element in Greek. I don't know, but there's the air. I don't know if spirit even counts as an element or not, but it's interesting. So there was spirit, then there's the element of air, and for and. Um, I don't know what it means by which particular which of others. Female was linked to creation, but not the only number linked to creation. Masculine might have its own link to creation, but anyway. Um, third, primitive water. He also formed and designed from his spirit and from the void and formless, made earth, even as a rampart or standing wall, and varied its surface, even as the crossing of beams. Fourth, from the water he designed fire, and from it formed for himself a throne of honor, made out of fire, with orphanim, seraphim, holy animals, and ministering angels. And that's why seraphim aren't angels, because he created angels separately. Uh, and with these he formed his dwelling, as is written in the text, who maketh his angels, spirits, and ministers a flaming fire. Psalm 104, version 4. Hmm. I'd say it does make more sense than the Bible. It really does. He selected three letters from the simple ones and sealed them as forming his great name, I-H-U. And he sealed the universe in six directions. Well, I mean, you could just say up, down, left, right, or back. I don't think that's it, but that sounds like to represent three dimensions. Uh, wait. Three dimensions, uh, but there's more to that than reality. There's more than three dimensions. So, anyway, it says five. He looked above and sealed the height with IHU. He looked below and sealed the deep with IH with IUH. He looked forward and sealed the east with HIU. He looked backwards and sealed the west with UHI. He looked to the right and sealed the south with UIH. He looked to the left and sealed the north with HUI. 12. These are the 10 ineffable existences. The spirit of the living God, air, water, fire, height, and depth east and west, north and south. And these 10 are, I would say, my impression is that these are the Sephiroth. So they're the numbers and they represent the order in which things were created. And that must be significant. Um, yeah, it's almost like it's a spell, given that it's sealed in different directions, but 
Hmm. So the first four, so five of the 10 are, not, are directions, it seems. Uh, and before that, it's, well, yeah, I'll go over it again. Spirit, then air, then water, then fire. That's four of them. Spirit, air, water, fire, that's four. Spirit, air, water, fire. And height is five. Yeah, there's six directions actually, obviously. Yeah, and that makes 10. Interesting. Chapter two. Section one, the foundations are the 22 letters, three mothers, seven double and 12 single letters, three mothers, namely A-M-S-H. These are, or A-M-H. These are air, water and fire, mute as water, hissing as fire and air of a spiritual type is the tongue of a balance standing erect between them pointing out the equilibrium which stands. What, so a pyramid? A balance standing erect between them, pointing out an equilibrium which exists. So yeah, it seems like a three-sided pyramid. The upward facing one, perhaps, but a pyramid symbolically important too. He hath formed, weighed, and transmuted, composed, and created these 22 letters, every living being and every soul yet uncreated. Even the uncreated ones. Everything. All of the possibilities. Already, like, formulated before they're manifest. Or let's say, created. Because all the possibilities already there. Time is illusion anyway, so that's the Akashic record, right? Everything that is and will be, right? Right, see if I can get to the next page without skipping to because they're sticking. Right, okay, so 22 letters are formed by the voice and pressed on the air and audibly uttered in five situations. In thro the throat, guttural sounds, in the palate, palatals, by the tongue, linguals, through the teeth, dentals, and by the lips, labial sounds. So different types of sounds we make are fundamentally linked to the nature of creation itself, it seems, or at least that's what it's saying. Um, interesting. So the idea that we are created in line with the formulation of the universe and the idea of as above, so below, fundamentally, in, in light of that, it makes sense, right? Everything corresponds to everything else, right? In every level of existence. And why wouldn't we be created with those same kind of, in a way that corresponds to the universe of itself on the highest level? So, so yeah. These 22 letters, the foundations, he arranged as on a spear, representing the whole, right? Um, and a Eurobolus, but 3D. So um, with 231 modes of entrance. Again, if you could look up the numerology of that number, 231, you might find something interesting. I don't even know it's fine because it's just not practical while I'm recording to look that up. It's just not. I don't think. I mean, I could do it, but you'd be waiting for me while I'm looking up. So yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, if the spear be rotated forwards, good is implied. If in a retrograde manner, evil is intended. 
what it reminded me of just there is actually the idea of a spiral spiraling up or spiraling down um, or going up a spiral or down a spiral uh, but just done a, a spiral that if a spiral is three dimensions of a circle that repeats but going up if you get a sphere that spirals five dimensionally um, and you spiral up but forwards say, well, that's good in the word of commas. And if you spiral, spiral five dimensionally backwards, then that's evil. Seems to refer to the polarity of service itself and service to others, right? So, no, service to others is of itself. Um, The rotation of a sphere, though, that, that is pretty interesting. So interesting, if a sphere itself is rolling, the trajectory of that rolling sphere creates a line. And suppose that line goes in a circle. And that circle, when it reaches where it started, is actually either higher or lower, based on whether it's, well, moving forwards, or back, because if it's going backwards, then that would be like the hero's journey in reverse. I don't know. I just thought the idea of you just like create a roll, the ball rolling would fundamentally roll on the trajectory. Yeah, yeah. So, for he indeed shewed the mode of combination of the letters, each with each, a left with all, and all with a left. Thus, in combining all together in pairs, are produced these 231 gates of knowledge. It's a whole bunch of pairs, yet they create an odd number. It might be a whole bunch of pairs plus the one that's original, maybe. Or maybe something else is going on, but unison of opposites seems to be suggested in duality because when it, wherever there's duality, there's one. But the one of each of those dualities is the same one, right? So maybe because the whole the one that that is all opposites are united in the same unity, uh, right? And all of that together forms a sphere. Are you are you seeing that in your mind's eye? If you think, if you look at the North Pole, for example, you see a whole bunch of lines going around in different trajectories, making a sphere. And where they connect is um, represents a whole, right? But then that would mean they connect in two places. Ah, but then there'd be a positive polarity where they connect and a negative polarity where they connect. But both of those polarities are two sides of the same sphere, which is the whole. So even those two polarities are one. Now that's interesting. Anyway. Um, and from nothingness did he make something and all forms of speech and every creative thing from the empty void, he made the solid earth, and from the non-existence, he brought forth life. Which reminds me of the idea of what I was saying at the beginning of everything coming from nothing, and yet nothing being everything, because it's all the potentialities. Because it's nothing in particular, and because that's like the, you could say the source field, you could say the Akashic record, or you could say the, um, quantum, what is it? Superposition, I suppose. Th th those are different ways of looking at it. Well, I don't know. Well, it's my one way of looking at it, I suppose. Life was brought forth from the non-existent. And yet the non-existent at that point already formulated possibilities because it said, um, he hath formed, weighed, transmuted, composed, and created 
with these 23 letters, every living being and soul, and, uh, and every soul yet uncreated. And then they were created. Or at least the ones that have been were. He hewed, as it were, immense columns or colossal pillars out of the intangible air and from the empty space. And this is the impress of the whole, 21 letters, or from one be a left. The Alpha. Okay. And as just like everything comes from one, every letter comes from one, the alpha. And these letters are fundamentally related to creation. Interesting. So, chapter three, section one the three mother letters, A, M, Sh, are the foundations of the whole and resemble a balance, the good in one scale, the either in the other, and the oscillating tongue of the balance between them. Now, I like that, right? That, that's so like Taoist, right? Because like, if you listen to the um, my Taoist readings, um, and uh, well, I guess a whole bunch of stuff I've been talking about where it's, where it's just like, okay, duality is there's one and the two. Well, there was one, that was all. Then you get the duality of split in two, one and the other. They're opposite, but we unify the opposites and you get three, right? But, and these three all together are part of the one anyway, but the third one is the balance between the first two. It is, but it's oscillating, which oscillating, by the way, clearly represents um, frequency and vibration, which move up, down, up, down, up, down, like a wave, because they are a wave, or should I say a field, because it's not two-dimensional. Um, so, and that's an oscillating tongue, which, by the way, brings forth the idea of a flame, because flames sort of have a tongue to them, don't they? That oscillate. And that's the balance in between. And the balance isn't one fixed point. It, 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 it's oscillating. And that's the way. That's the Tao, right? The Tao is three. but it's also the whole. But then the unison of opposites is unity, which is the whole, so. Very interesting. Two, these three mothers enclose a mighty mystery, most occult and most marvelous, sealed as with six rings, and from them proceed primeval, primeval fire, water, and air, which are three, by the way. So is air the, the oscillating tongue? Was that fire? I think to remember the fire was created, the third one created. So three might be the fire. Air is the one. No, wait. The first of well, there's three elements, but before that was spirit. If you ignore spirit, then that'd be, there's the one and the whole as the whole. Then there's the elements, one, air, two, water, three, fire. Fire, maybe. Or maybe, it's, maybe I'm getting the elements mixed up here. But anyway, I do suspect, the one, two, and three are linked to elements. These are subsequently differentiated into male and female. This being the source of duality, or polarity. Okay, polarity, of course, is in the universe, and that's going to apply to gender. Is going to come from that. That's where gender comes from. Gender in an energetic sense. What is gender in a unified sense? What is the unification of masculine and female energies? What is that thing that gender is? 
because we always associate gender in terms of male and female. But what is it when it transcends that? I mean, we could say, oh, we kind of have features of both, but it would be an oscillating wave. With features of both. Oscillating between them, and oscillating tongue of the balance between them. I suppose you could just call it male, female, right? You could just call it gender, but it's a different understanding of gender. It's non-dualistic gender or unified gender. Anyway, so at first existed these three mothers and there rose three masculine powers and hence all things have originated. And there's six, like the six directions, maybe. Maybe that's connected to the six directions addressed, maybe not. Three, the three mothers are A, M, Ch, which has already been mentioned. Okay, right, there's three mothers and those three mothers have the birth, the three elements which correspond by the law of correspondence, as above, so below, to the three mothers. And in correspondence to that, there are three masculine powers. Are there three fathers or are they just three sons? Perhaps three sons, I'm not sure. And hence, all things have originated. Yeah. And there rose three masculine powers and hence all things have originated. The three mothers are A, M, Sh, and in the beginning, as to the macrocosm, the heavens were created from fire, the earth from primeval water, and the air was formed from the spirit, which stands alone in the midst and is the mediator between them. Think a pyramid, a three-sided pyramid of the three elements and the top bit looking down on it all is the spirit, being the origin of them anyway. And in that light, and given that the physical holographic universe is born from the two primordial elements, then it's spirit that ultimately creates the primordial elements and thus the holographic universe, which makes sense <clears throat> and immediates it. So that also makes sense. In the year or well, as regards time, these three mothers represent heat, cold, and a temperate climate. The heat from the fire, the cold from the water, and the temperate state from the spiritual air, which again is an equalizer between them. Okay, so the air is the oscillating tongue of balance between them. And keep in mind, a fire is a fire, but it oscillates due to air, perhaps not by its nature inherently. I think that's true, but I'm not sure, but it makes sense. So yeah, so the air is the spirit, it's formed from the spirit, but is itself an element and is the mediator, the oscillating tongue of balance between the two opposites, which are fire and water, which makes sense because one's hot, one's cold. They're a polarity. Yeah. So the heat, and also this is a correspondence. So they, they link between heat, Cold, fire, water, the lowest correspondence as above, so below, it makes sense. The cold from the water and the temperate, yeah, uh, yeah, that's four. These three mothers again represent in the microcosm or human form, male and female, the head, the belly, and the chest. The head from the fire, the belly from the water, and the chest from the air lieth between them which is why unity is linked to love and love is linked to the heart and air is linked to balance and unity and integration. And that's where the heart is. So, okay, makes sense. And you could say, 
those who, when there's an imbalance and only the water, say, or only the cold, only the water and the lack of the divine fire coming from above, what you will get is what well, people will describe it like that as cold, right? Or they might even describe it as heartless. That's linked. Right? Or maybe even soulless. So perhaps the water element is actually linked to negative polarity, is in service to self, and fire is linked to service to others. That seems a bit too simplistic, but there might be something to that, but not in a really simplistic way. I think there's nuance that I'm kind of not elaborating on there, but I don't know what the nuance is. I just know that it's there. <laughs> um, so from these mothers, did he create form and design and combine with the three mothers in the world? So there's three mothers in the world, but there's three mothers that aren't in the world and they correspond to each other. And in the year and in man, both male and female. So time comes from that. And, and in humanity, both female and male and female come from that. And that's the root of polarity, perhaps. He caused Aleph to reign in the air and crowned it and combined one with the other. And with these, he sealed the air in the world, the temperate climate of the year and the chest, the lungs for breathing air in man. The, ma the male with AMS and the female with SMA. Oh, I will add, though, that when I was talking about some elements linked to self and self to others and stuff, that's when there's an imbalance, which is dualistic. The integration is um, obviously healthier. Okay, he, hauled, he caused Mem to, I don't know if that's a typo or what, but he, or maybe it's not, I don't know. He caused Mem to predominate in water and crowned it and combined it with others and formed earth on the world, cold in the year and the fruit of the womb in mankind being carried in the baby. And it's interesting that obviously we, when we design in a sense uh, the incarnation beforehand on some level, we, we even, there's a divine act of creation in in a um, when you incarnate oneself into your mother's womb. Uh, wow, that's one thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> Incarnating yourself into your mother's womb. Anyway, um, okay. He caused Shin to reign in fire and crowned it and combined one with the other and sealed them as heaven in the universe, as heat in the year, and as the head of man and woman. Hmm. This is brackets 18 there. Um, I don't know what that means. You know, so we've got 11 chapters in. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. What am I saying? Oh, we've got three, sorry. So I saw one B and I was like, that's 11, 12. Oh, no. Doesn't matter. Okay, so I got to the end of chapter three. Whoa. I'm almost, we're almost halfway through this. This, is not, this isn't actually that long, but there is actually a lot to talk about. You know, what this reminds me most of reading is actually the Emerald Tablets of Hermes Trismegistus. Um, that's what it, reading it feels like that more than anything else. You know, to, but reading it, it does remind you how much of a bastardization the the Bible that most people read is from what actual, the actual origin of things, it, just by looking at like the actual Jewish texts here. Um, well, this is one of them anyway. Um, so, 
Um, I will obviously do carry on reading this. It's pretty interesting to read, but obviously it wasn't necessarily easy to read. Uh, I'm sorry if it was boring at the beginning. Uh, hopefully you have patience to get through that and you're still here. Although if you're not, you wouldn't hear this, would you? Um, so, um, Oh, and it's definitely very interesting to read this. I'm glad I came across this, or it came to me, because uh, I do think the synchronicity involved in me in getting this. So, so yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I did, and uh, bye for now.